Welcome to Pals. It's Professor Yung's Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you're just joining us, you have not subscribed, we'd like you to subscribe now and be part of this amazing anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. This is the part two in our series of lecture on posterior abdominal region. In this section, we'll be discussing the vessels and nerves of posterior abdominal region. So let's go to class. The first vessel we'll be considering in this part is the major vessel of the abdomen, and that is the abdominal aorta. And then the next vessel will be the inferior vena cava. We'll start with the abdominal aorta. Now in this our chart, here is the abdominal aorta. It's actually the continuation of the descending thoracic aorta. The aorta has three parts. We have the ascending aorta, we have the arch of aorta, we have the descending thoracic aorta, and we have the abdominal aorta. Now, this artery is located in the posterior abdominal wall, and in here we find it as a retroperitoneal organ. It's found in the retroperitoneal space in the posterior abdominal wall, and we will see it supplying all the abdominal organs. And then it will give terminal branches that will run down to the pelvis and even to the lower limbs. And it will also supply the undersurface of the diaphragm. Here is also the diaphragm. And then give supply also to the to part of the abdominal wall. Now we'll start with the beginning of this artery. This artery actually started from the aortic opening, which is called the aortic hiatus. And here is the in this diagram, here is the aortic opening or the aortic hiatus, and this opening is seen to be approximately at the level of the T12 vertebra. Now, it begins from this point, it will pass downwards on the anterior surface of the bodies of T12 to L4 vertebra. Let's also use this diagram here. We see the artery running down and then running actually on the anterior surface of these bones. As we noted earlier, T T12 to L4, and it will end just the left of the midline at the lower end of the L4 vertebra. That's at this point where it will end, and at that point it will divide into its two terminal branches. And the length of this artery in this area is about 13 cm. Now this artery will enter the abdomen, as we noted earlier by piercing through the thoracic diaphragm and we said that that opening is called the aortic opening and we also said that that level is at the level of the t12 vertebra and this opening is actually seen below the median acute ligament and this median acute ligament will be seen between the right and left crura of the diaphragm now this artery as it passes through the aortic opening is seen to travel with two other major structures and what are those vessels one is the zygous vein and then the second one is the thoracic duct so at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebra we have the aortic opening that will allow the passage of the abdominal artery and now the thoracic duct and azygous vein now as the aorta runs distally on the anterior surface of the lumbar vertebra, it actually moves a little to the left of the midline. And as it does that, we see the inferior vena cava lying on its right. And as a result of this movement of the aorta a little to the left, and then the inferior vena cava a little to the right, we will notice that right-sided arteries are a little bit longer than their left-sided counterparts. Now, we also notice that at this terminal point where the division is made, it is at a point 2.5 cm below the umbilicus. So, the point of bifurcation of the aorta is at a point 2.5 cm below the level of the umbilicus. This point is also at level with the line extending between the highest point of the iliac crest and then these points are here so we're seeing those high points of the iliac crest 
that are at the same level with the point of bifurcation of the abdominal aorta, which we also say is 2.5 cm below the level of the umbilicus. The common iliac arteries in this picture will run inferiorly and laterally, both the right and the left, and they will pass into the medial border of the Suez major into the pelvic brim. Here is the Suez major, and then we see the right and left common iliac arteries running on their medial borders. In this section, we we'll consider the relations of the abdominal aorta. Now, we we'll start with the anterior relations. Now, this again is the abdominal aorta, and then the following structures here are structures that will be noting to be forming its uh, anterior relation. Number one is the celiac plexus and the ganglion. And then number two is the body of the pancreas. Here we're looking at this structure here is the body of the pancreas. And then we have running with T here. We'll be seeing the splenic vein. Also at this point, we'll be seeing the left renal vein as it's passing towards the inferior vena cava. That's the left renal vein passing across to the inferior vena cava. We'll also be seeing the first part of the small intestine, which is the duodenum. Here is the duodenum, that's the, the entire part of the duodenum. I will be seeing the horizontal part of the duodenum relating with the this artery, and this is the horizontal part. And then finally, we'll also be seeing some other parts of the small intestine. We'll be seeing the cause of small intestine forming its anterior boundary. For the posterior relations, here are the posterior relations. These are the posterior relations, and they are made up of the T12 vertebra and will run down to the L4 vertebra. If we remember that at, it's at the point of L4 vertebra that this aorta, this artery divided into two. There are other smaller structures like a number of lumbar veins that cross it posteriorly as they pass to the inferior vena cava. So those other smaller veins that pass deep to it will also form its posterior relation. We will next consider the right side. In the right side, we see a number of structures. Now, here is the right side. And in this right side, we'll be seeing structures such as the Cicena chile. We'll be seeing the thoracic duct. If you remember, it entered with the thoracic duct at the level of the T12 in the aortic opening. We we'll also see the zygous vein and some other parts of the diaphragm, which is the right cross of the diaphragm. This is the right cross of the diaphragm. And then finally, we'll also be seeing the inferior of the neck cover, all forming the right boundaries. For the left boundary, we'll be looking at the left celiac ganglion. The next part of this artery we'll look at is the branches. Most of the arteries supplying the posterior abdominal wall will rise from the abdominal aorta, as we noted in the beginning of this class, but this is with exception to an artery, which is a subcostal artery. This artery will be rising from the thoracic aorta, but will be distributing below the level of 12th rib, which is into the abdominal cavity. So we we'll divide branches of the abdominal aorta into these categories. One, we'll be looking at visceral branches and abdominal branches. So for the visceral branches, we'll be seeing two parts. We'll be seeing the single branches and the paired branches. We're going to start with the single anterior visceral branches. And then these branches are one, here we're seeing the celiac trunk, two, here we're seeing the superior mesenteric artery, and three, here we're seeing the inferior mesenteric artery. These three arteries will form the three single anterior visceral branches. Now for the paired branches, there are three of them. So where are these branches? We'll be seeing one, we'll be looking at the suprarenal artery, Number two, we'll be looking at the renal artery. And then number three, we'll be looking at the gonadal artery. So the artery, suprarenal, the renal, and gonadal. Now we have those abdominal branches. Those abdominal branches are five. 
What are the five we'll be seeing from above? We'll be looking at the inferior phrenic branch that will be seen here, and then we'll be seeing the rest branches which are called the lumbar arteries. So what are they? We'll be looking at the inferior phrenic and the four lumbar arteries, and these are the four lumbar arteries. Now, we also have terminal branches. It depends on the reference. Some call it two terminal branches. Some also call it three terminal branches. Why are we talking about three terminal branches? Because we are seeing this branch here. This branch here is called the median sacral artery. We see it also coming off at this level of the fourth lumbar vertebra. So we can go with the theory of three terminal branches. In this case, we'll be talking about the two common iliac and this branch at the middle, which is called the median sacral artery. So, to enable us to recall the various branches of the abdominal aorta, we have this mnemonic that could help us. And what is the mnemonic? Caesarean section in some races induces irregular late menstrual cycle. We will now take some more information on the branches of the abdominal aorta. Now, the inferior vena cava runs parallel to the aorta on its right hand side. And because the inferior vena cava is in the way, the right renal artery has to pass behind it to get to the right kidney. The gonadal arteries, testicular men and ovarian in women, are actually situated surprisingly high up in the abdomen. And why is it so? Why is it not low, close to the gonads? It is so because during early fetal life, the gonads begin to develop alongside with the kidney before they now migrate downwards to their proper positions. So what happens? They get their blood supply from where they actually started, which is from that high point. So you see the gonadal artery starting from a high point in the abdominal artery and not from where they end. Finally, we see the lumbar arteries which arise posteriorly and will not be easily seen on most anatomical sections. Now look at the some other visceral branches. We say there are three. The celiac. Here is the celiac. And for the celiac, we said it supplies the abdominal foregut. The celiac trunk will supply the abdominal foregut. The superior mesenteric artery will arise from the front of the abdominal aorta and this is about 1 cm below the celiac trunk and at the level of the lower border of L1 vertebra. It supplies the abdominal midgut. Now, the inferior mesenteric, here is the inferior mesenteric, will arise from the front of the aorta too, and this is about 4 cm above its bifurcation and at the level of the L3 vertebra. So we are seeing celiac trunk at T12, superior mesenteric at L1 and then the inferior mesenteric at L3. This inferior mesenteric will supply the abdominal hind gut. Now look at some of the paired branches. Supraenal artery that actually came from the abdominal aorta is the part that is called the middle suprarenal artery. And here is actually the middle suprarenal artery. We have the superior suprarenal artery, we have the middle suprarenal artery, and we have the inferior suprarenal artery. Now the superior suprarenal artery will be coming as a branch. This artery here is the inferior phrenic artery. We'll be seeing a branch of the inferior phrenic artery running to the adrenal gland or suprarenal gland. Now which part is the inferior suprarenal artery coming from? The inferior suprarenal artery is actually a branch from the renal artery. So what are those contributions to suprarenal artery, the contributions are the branch from the inferior phrenic artery, which is called the superior suprarenal artery. Now we have the branch from the abdominal aorta itself, called the middle suprarenal artery, and then we have the branch coming from the renal artery, and that branch is the inferior suprarenal artery. Now for the gonadal arteries, here here is the gonadal artery. The gonadal artery will be coming off from the a level below the level of the renal artery.
from this point of their origin they will run downwards and then running on the surface of the psoas major muscle now we'll look at some of the postural branches and these are the inferior phrenic we've talked about them here is the inferior phrenic that's the inferior phrenic artery there and then here we're seeing part of the lumbar arteries and then here we see the median sacral artery here now just take a little information on the celiac trunk here is the celiac trunk is actually short wide vessel that's about 1.25 cm in length at what point does it pick origin from we've talked about it we said it picked origin from the anterior aspect of the abdominal aorta at about the 12th thoracic vertebra and its junction with l1 vertebra it also has major branches what are those branches we have the left gastric here is the left gastric artery the common hepatic artery and then here is the common hepatic artery and finally we are looking at the splenic artery so for the inferior phrenic artery these are the two inferior phrenic arteries the right and the left this artery will be seen coming off from the abdominal aorta at the point immediately the abdominal aorta entered the abdomen and these are the level of the t12 thoracic vertebra and it will now be seen running at the inferior surface of the diaphragm and then also this artery will now give off the branch of the the branch of the suprarenal artery which we call the superior suprarenal artery so for the lumbar arteries these are the lumbar arteries these branches will come off from the abdominal aorta and then they will run laterally both on the right and on the left to run to the abdominal wall where they give their supplies here is the median sacral artery this is the median sacral artery it will also come off from the posterior surface of the abdominal aorta and this is a little above the point of its bifurcation as it does that it will run distally running on the anterior surface of the l5 vertebra and also on the anterior surface of the sacrum now here these are the common iliac arteries they are the terminal branches of the abdominal aorta each artery begins from the body of l4 vertebra which is the point of the bifurcation now the left common artery is shorter than the right common artery the left common iliac artery is 4 cm and it is shorter than the right common iliac artery which is 5 cm each of these arteries will move downwards and laterally and they will terminate in front of the sacroiliac joint by dividing into external and internal iliac arteries and this is where the point is having this is where the external begins to run down and then this is where internal begins to run into the pelvis the right common iliac artery will pass in front of the commencement of the inferior vena cava and will run distally to the thigh as the femoral artery now for the standard iliac artery it is one of the two terminal branches of the common iliac artery it will run distally and terminate as a femoral artery and this actually at the point behind the inguinal ligament we will see two branches what are those branches we will be seeing the inferior epigastric branch here and we will be seeing deep circumflex deep circumflex iliac artery here so here again is a summary a tabular summary of all the branches coming from the abdominal aorta now be considering the next vessel we'll be looking at in this lecture and then that is the inferior vena cava the inferior vena cava is actually the largest and it's the widest vein in the body it's about 20 cm in length out of this total length 18 cm will be seen in the abdomen and then the rest will be seen within the thorax where it ran in to join the right atrium of the heart this vein will drain most of the blood from below the 
diaphragm and it will bring them into the right atrium of the heart. We will consider the formation of this vein. The inferior vena cava is actually formed by union of two common iliac veins. So these are the iliac veins, that's it. the right and the left common iliac veins will come together and fuse together to form the inferior vena cava. Now, in its termination, this is the inferior vena cava, it will run proximally and pierce through the thoracic diaphragm at the level of the T8 vertebra and it will run into the thoracic cavity where it will now enter into the right atrium of the heart at the level of the cyst costal cartilage. Now the inferior vena cava has a number of relations and um, as we said it is formed by the union of the right and left common iliac veins and this is in front of the body of L5 vertebra. This is the right and the left common iliac veins and then this, this points at the level of the fifth lumbar vertebra. Now it will run upwards and this will be in front of the vertebral column but on the right side of the aorta. So that's what it does. The after formation it will move upwards. Now as it enters the thoracic cavity it will pierce the diaphragm at the level of T8 vertebra and it will terminate by entering into the right atrium of the heart. The inferior vena cava will be seen running across the anterior surface of eight vertebra. And what are those vertebra? We have L4 to T8. And it is also about twice the length of the abdominal aorta. Now let's consider the relations of the inferior vena cava. We'll start with the anterior relations. Now here again is the inferior vena cava. Now we see a number of structures forming its relation, anterior relation, and we have the root of mesentery, we have the gonadal artery, you can also call it testicular, you can call it ovarian artery. Now we also talked about the top part of duodenum, we see a number of those structures forming anterior relation of the, of the abdominal aorta, also forming anterior relation of the inferior vena cava here. In addition, we also be seeing the head of pancreas, and bile duct as we saw in the uh, forming in the relations of the aorta we also have other structures like the portal vein and the posterior surface of the liver now when we look at the posterior relation and we run from below upwards we'll be seeing one the right sympathetic chain and psoas major muscle two two we have the right renal artery three we have the right celiac ganglion Four, we have the right suprarenal gland. Five, we have the middle suprarenal vein. And finally, we have the right inferior phrenic artery. Now, we'll look at tributaries of the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava receives a number of tributaries. Now, we'll look at the three formative tributaries that is, the right and the left common iliac veins, and also the median sacral vein. We also have other structures that form this tributary, like the inferior phrenic vein, we have the third and fourth lumbar veins. Here we are seeing the third and fourth lumbar veins, and then at the proximal part here we are seeing the inferior phrenic vein. We also have some other lateral visceral tributaries, such as the right suprarenal vein, as you can see here, the right suprarenal vein, we have the renal vein itself, and then we have the right testicular ovarian, or we can just call it the gonadal vein. That is the right gonadal vein. So again, we are looking at the three anterior visceral tributaries. And what are they? They are the hepatic veins. And here we have the right, the middle, and the left hepatic veins. Now the nerves of the posterior abdominal wall. We have about nine nerves that can be grouped in this classification. We have the subcostal, iliohypogastric, iliolingual, genitofemoral nerve, lateral femoral, cutaneous nerve, femoral nerve, obturator nerve, accessory obturator nerve, and finally the 
lobo sacral trunk. Now we consider a few clinical correlates. The first is psoas abscess. Here is a condition of psoas abscess. In this condition, there is accumulation of pus in the vertebral column. Now, pus will be trickling along the psoas muscle within the psoas sheath. And this pus will pass underneath the inguinal ligament. Here is the inguinal ligament. It will pass underneath this. It will go beyond the inguinal ligament and then will accumulate and present as a swelling in the groin, which will be seen below the level of the inguinal ligament. The next clinical condition we we'll consider is abdominal aortic aneurysm. Usually, the abdominal artery has an average diameter of less than 2 cm, and this dimension will increase slightly in size with age. But if the diameter becomes greater than 3 cm, the patient has a condition which is known as abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now, this situation usually comes as a result of atherosclerosis. We could have trauma to the abdominal aorta, and this is actually a very dangerous trauma, and this could come as a result of car accident or penetrating injuries. It can also come as a result of stabbing and gunshot injuries. Now, the problem with this injury type is because of the heavy bleeding from the abdominal aorta, which will actually fill the entire system. And this condition is actually very catastrophic and has very mortality rate unless the patient gets to the operating theater very quickly. Now, the next condition is compression of the inferior vena cava, and this could come either as a result of a light uterus or even a tumor. Now, inferior vena cava is commonly compressed by an enlarged uterus, and this is during the last trimester of the pregnancy, and is most common with the women when they are lying supine. This could bring about edema of the ankle, feet, and then varicose veins, in the lower limb. This is a situation where there's a child with a, lo a lot of capacity to occlude the flow of blood in this area or this area. We can also have compression of inferior vena cava through tumors, malignant and retroperitoneal tumors. Now, when compression and blockage of the inferior vena cava by malignant tumors happens, it will result into dilation of the anastomostic channel, which is between the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava, and this is called the caval caval shunt. So the blood now could be returned to the right atrium via the superior vena cava. Clinically, it presents as the prominent subcutaneous vein called thoracoabdominal vein. Here is actually a tumor that is already pressing on this inferior vena cover. This is where we end our lecture today on Opposite Abdominal Region. If you have questions, if you have comments, suggestions, please drop them in the comment section. If you consider this material helpful, we encourage you to subscribe, like our video, and share it to your friends that it will also be helpful to. And together, we will build a unique anatomy family where we make anatomy simple.